Mega Republicans are out here with their Russian talking points, attacking Ukraine like they have a goddamn clue, and it puts us all in danger. You want to know what's going on over there? Let's talk about what's going on over there. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. It's been one year since the Russian Federation invaded Ukraine under the false pretense of demilitarizing and denazifying the country. On February 24th, 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin launched an armed offensive into Ukraine from the north, east, and south, claiming it to be a special military operation to protect ethnic Russians and to keep Ukraine in the sphere of Russian influence. Understandably, Ukraine saw 190,000 Russian soldiers pouring across their borders as an act of war, an illegal act of aggression against a sovereign democratic nation. And with the support and aid of the NATO nations and the European Union, they chose to fight back. We have to remember that this was not something that had to happen. There was no burning conflict between neighboring nations that spilled into war. This was something Russia chose to do. There is no both sides here. Yes, it takes two to tango, but in this case, one dancer was handcuffed to the other against their will. This is not something Ukraine got itself into. This is something Russia forced upon them. The blame for this war and the human, financial, and geopolitical cost of it belongs solely on the leadership of the Russian Federation. In fact, right up to the moment before Russian missiles filled Ukrainian skies, before the biggest air, sea, and ground assault in Europe since World War II, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky was still appealing to Russia to not invade his country. In the dead of night, before the first soldier crossed his border, he recorded a video plea to Putin, seeking peace and asking for reason to prevail. Like all the NATO leaders and representatives who had spoken to Putin before, he was trying to convince him of another course of action. Zelensky warned Russia that the consequences of his choice would be terrible. He spoke of the abundance of pain, filth, blood, and death that would follow such an action. He explained that the war would be a calamity that would carry a huge cost in every meaning of the word. And yet Russia, but more specifically Russian leadership, could not be swayed. So with the one-year mark of this unnecessary and tragic war, I thought we should take a moment to talk about it. For the most part, the war in Ukraine is not really on people's radar anymore. It sits somewhere in the periphery. I mean, we know it's going on, but it's not really affecting us. We hear snippets. You know, we're sending more money. This kind of anti-aircraft missile is going over. President Zelensky made a speech to Congress. Russia is making nuclear threats. But honestly, our news feeds are filled with Republican House members' random congressional hearings about things like Twitter and what George Santos is lying about now or what Marjorie Taylor Greene means when she talks about a national divorce. Some people were even mad that we were talking about the bravery and leadership of President Biden visiting an active war zone in Kyiv for the anniversary of the conflict because he hadn't yet been to Ohio, where a train derailment had happened. Or they believed that federal money should be going to the people of East Palestine rather than Ukraine, not realizing that A, the Ohio governor hasn't asked for any money or aid, and that B, money allotted for disaster cleanups through FEMA is not remotely the same money allotted for national defense and foreign aid. Aid. But the general gist I'm hearing is that Ukraine is far away and the war doesn't really affect us. So why should we care? Why are we still sending money? How does sending aid even help us? So I wanted to take a moment to break it down, to tell you why defeating the Russians in Ukraine, as Republican Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said on Fox News, is the single most important event we have going on in the world right now. And that softening on the war or second-guessing our role in helping the Ukrainians achieve victory shouldn't be a thing. As McConnell said, I'm sorry that public opinion is sliding, but I need to assure the American people that this is enormously important, and we must stay together on a bipartisan basis to support these people who are bravely fighting for freedom and democracy. And I rarely agree with Mitch McConnell, so you know this is a big deal. Despite what you hear from ultra-mega representatives complaining about all the money being spent, according to another Republican Senator, Mitt Romney, the spending we're doing on Ukraine is very much in line with any spending we do for national defense. We spend about $750 billion a year protecting America's interest abroad. 
Now, there's a legitimate debate to be had about that number. If perhaps we could be spending some of that money on the American people or on domestic programs that could help us improve our quality of life. But we're not going to have that debate in the middle of an ongoing war with the very people who vote against that kind of public spending anytime it comes up. The people complaining about the costs of this war are the same ones who vote against cutting medical costs, against universal health care, against climate initiatives and raising the minimum wage. What they do consistently vote for is the military-industrial complex and protecting America's national security against foreign adversaries that would threaten us. So Ukraine would fall deeply into that bucket. The argument about money has more to do with sowing unrest among the American people for political gain than any concern about spending. And just to drive that point home, according to Mitch McConnell, the spending on this war so far comes out to be about 0.02% of our GDP. So no matter what mean-spirited, self-serving GOP politicians like Ted Cruz, who just called President Zelensky's battle fatigues a costume and accused the leader of fighting a frontline battle between democracy and autocracy as being engaged in theater on his podcast, the truth is the winner of this war will set the terms for the future of geopolitics, which will deeply affect American security and prosperity. So the naysayers are just wrong. What's being decided now is if we'll be living in a world where one country can simply invade another, destroy their economy and their infrastructure, and commit genocide on their people in flagrant disregard for international law, or if we live in a world where there are actual consequences for this kind of barbarism and horror. Are strong nations simply allowed to take over others without recourse, or does the world order stand against that? Does democracy prevail? Or are we looking at a future of autocrats where might means right? As Timothy Snyder, professor of history at Yale University and author of The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, America says, a hundred years from now, historians will be writing about the war in Ukraine. Everything that grabs our attention or the airwaves right now, gas prices, masks, Hunter Biden's laptop, will have all but disappeared into the mists of time. But whether Ukraine wins or loses this war is something historians are going to be writing about for generations to come. A lot has happened since Russia invaded Ukraine, and we need to be clear that any space that might have been open for Ukrainian public opinion to lean towards concessions to Russia are all but gone. This has been a brutal war, but it's important we remember that this hot war is just the latest phase in a conflict that began in 2014 when the Russian military illegally seized a region in the southeast border of Ukraine called Crimea and took it for themselves. And then they backed a separatist campaign in the Donbass region of Ukraine to claim that for Russia as well. In fact, Russia has been violating Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity for decades, including having the first group of Ukrainian presidents simply be puppet governments for the Kremlin, allowing Russia to rule the country by proxy. It was this Russian control of Ukrainian government and the corrupt elections that led to it that finally caused the Ukrainian people to rise up in revolution and open the door to free and fair elections. And once they were under their own control and listened to the will of their own people, Ukraine started making decisions Russia didn't like, like becoming closer with Europe or talking about joining NATO. To understand this war, you have to understand that Putin sees Ukraine as part of Russia, at best a satellite state, and losing control of it, especially to a pro-democratic faction that was friendly with the EU, was absolutely unacceptable to him. Experts believe that Putin saw Moscow and Kyiv as one in the same, and it's his belief that the only reason the two capitals aren't one is because outside influences have kept them apart. Timothy Snyder explains that Putin's entire mindset is filtered through a Russian lens. He very rarely leaves Russia. He doesn't speak any other languages. He doesn't even really know that much about Ukraine. But if Ukraine didn't want to be part of Russia, in Putin's mind, that must be because of some kind of foreign conspiracy. In many ways, Putin has been able to bring a lot of the countries that were independent after the collapse of the Soviet Union back under his umbrella, or what he calls the Russian sphere of influence. The only country that seems to have truly evaded his grasp was Ukraine. And Ukraine was essential to him because of its size, its strategic location, and its relationship to Europe and its Western democratic values. As Fiona Hill, former official at the U.S. National Security Council, specializing in Russian and European affairs, puts it, Putin wanted to ensure that Ukraine, like other countries, had no other option than subjugation to Russia. 
Putin didn't like Ukraine playing footsie with Europe and making democracy look successful right on his border. He'd spent too long working to undermine democracy, to have any real elections and working rule of law right out in the open where people could see it. There were too many people who lived in Ukraine who had family in Russia and vice versa. Russians could see that Ukrainians could vote. They could see that their voices were heard and their revolutions were successful. They could see a peaceful transfer of power and watch the country drift closer to Europe and European values. And this was outrageous to Putin. America is often put up as Russia's enemy because Russia chooses to make us so. But Russia is also threatened by the European Union because it proves, with the right encouragement, aid, and norms, you can take a flawed post-communist state and make it a prosperous nation. European countries, just like America, show that there is a different way, maybe a better way, and that doesn't work for the Russian Federation. America is Russia's big bad enemy, not because America is actually a threat to Russia, but because America represents democracy, and democracy is a threat to Russian leadership. If Donald Trump did nothing else for Russia, he delivered on the idea that democracy America had been selling was a joke. He proved that rules didn't apply to everyone equally, that politics is fundamentally about rich guys becoming richer and corruption being normal. His outrageous rhetoric, his disrespect for American institutions, his lack of interest in the welfare of the American people, the countless scandals he's embroiled in, did more for Russian propaganda outlets than they could have ever done for themselves. Trump was out on the world stage showing American democracy to be the joke Russia always said it was. That this idea of a free and just society with the rule of law that respected its citizens with things like freedom and justice was just a fallacy. Timothy Snyder believes we've always misunderstood Putin, in that we misunderstood Russia as a failed transition to democracy. Snyder says Russia was never a failed transition to democracy. It was always an alternative to democracy, pretending to be a democracy, but which functioned on foreign policy to undermine real democracies. As Snyder puts it, the Putin regime is not about creating things. It's about removing alternatives and about making the corruption and the inequality and the spectacle and the constant lying seem normal. Whether Russia had goals for the Trump presidency or not, Trump gave them more than they could have ever hoped for. He made Putin's behavior seem normal, and he made American democracy look like Russian democracy, corrupt and lawless. It allowed Russia to be like, see? That's just how countries run. America's no different. Democracy doesn't work. There isn't a better alternative. Everyone is corrupt. Everyone lies. This whole rule of law thing is bullshit. So you should just take what you can get. No one was happier about January 6th than the Russians. All the things they had been preaching on their propaganda networks about democracy being a joke and peaceful transfers of power not being realistic, we gave them in 4K images. Putin has been sending the message that he was willing to fight back against democracy since 2007, when he made a speech at the National Security Conference calling the West Russia's enemy. If you look back on the speech Putin made before the war in Ukraine, what he still refers to as a special military operation, a fair amount of it is about the United States. Yes, the speech is about liberating Ukraine, but he's also talking about the empire of lies. Snyder points out that it's not that Putin is talking about real America, but the fantasy of America that he sells to his people, an America that wants to steal from them and take things from them and treat them badly, that of course America would do something insidious like try and take Ukraine from Russia. Snyder says the way to understand Putin is to follow the failure of his domestic policy. He came into power in 2000 with the basic idea that Russia could be made into some kind of rule of law state. At the time, Putin used the phrase dictatorship of the law. But when he realized he wasn't going to be able to do it with the oligarchy that was in place, he shifted gears to a different type of rule, one that included the oligarchy, just with himself as the top oligarch. What Snyder calls the boss of bosses. Every six years, Russia has elections, and every six years, Putin wins, by a lot. Experts say it's not even that people really believe Putin is winning, it's more that every six years he proves to them that he's in charge. This idea that elections could be real, that there are places where leaders can lose and then go away, is a threat to his very existence and to the way he believes Russia should be run. 
Putin has chosen a corrupt system. Russians don't get what they want out of their rule of law. Their social mobility and freedom is limited, and they only see and hear what their government allows them to see and hear in the media. And Putin spends an enormous amount of time and resources convincing his people of his chosen narrative. Before Putin ordered his troops into Ukraine, the Kremlin spent years spreading false narratives that would justify his military action. Many Russian soldiers and civilians really believed they were liberating the country from Nazis, that Ukrainians would be happy to be freed, that they were the good guys. Most of the things they read and saw in their country and learned in their schools fed into this narrative, like their entire country only has a version of Fox News, and they function under that reality. Our Fox News even helped them amplify Kremlin talking points in America. If you have ever heard that Ukraine was utilizing U.S.-funded research labs to develop bioweapons, that was a Russian piece of propaganda placed into the media ecosystem to justify an invasion. Once the war was started, the Russian government blocked all access to Western social media platforms inside the country, even designating Facebook, Meta, as an extremist organization. Prominent Putin critics either left Russia or were arrested. Putin criminalized independent reporting and stripped independent media of their licensing. The government passed a law imposing up to 15 years in prison for the spreading of fake news about the war. Saying the word war became illegal. Prominent radio stations were taken off the air. A newspaper led by a Nobel Peace Prize laureate lost his license. Entertainers who opposed the war quickly lost work as their shows were closed and people refused to hire them. Activists were arrested on charges of spreading false information, and anti-war protesters were detained and beaten or arrested and put in prison. Even people who weren't activists, just civilians publicly horrified by war, now face up to 10 years in jail. Putin created laws that effectively criminalized any public expression against the war. The crackdown was immediate and ruthless and unparalleled in post-Soviet Russia. It's impossible to deny that Putin was able to intimidate a majority of Russian society into silence. And, as you would expect with the purge of critics, it was followed by an influx of propaganda. State TV suspended entertainment programs and expanded political and news programming to boost the narrative that Russia was winning, ridding the Ukraine of Nazis, fighting the NATO puppets ruining Ukraine, just story after story of Russia's glory and how they would prevail. And at one point, a Russian TV host claimed that a new structure of the world was emerging and the planet was finally going to be rid of Western leadership. They went on to say, most of humanity is with us. The fact that most of humanity was not with them was unknown to most Russians. Propaganda and isolation work. And aside from the chaos in September, when Putin ordered the mobilization of 300,000 reservist soldiers to join the war, causing hundreds of thousands of Russian men to flee to neighboring countries to avoid being drafted, according to sociologists, most Russians have hardly been affected by the war at all. Although Russia has been hit with sanctions, they're surviving relatively well. The economy has outperformed expectations with record oil revenues after the war sent energy prices soaring and China stepped in to buy what the West wasn't. The central bank stabilized the plummeting ruble by raising interest rates, and their currency is now stronger against the dollar than it was before the invasion. McDonald's, Ikea, Apple, all the other major Western corporations that left Russia were quickly replaced with Russian versions of the same thing. Starbucks became Star's Coffee overnight, with essentially the exact same menu and logo. Visa and MasterCard services were cancelled, but switched to a local banking system, so their existing cards continued to work inside the country, and if you were traveling abroad, which really only the elites could do, you used cash. Flights out of Russia became so expensive that travel was really just for the ultra-rich, but only about a third of Russians have an international passport, so limiting their travel was of little consequence. And the oligarchs continued to oligarch no matter how many of their boats were seized. Now, inflation in Russia spiked nearly 12%. But Putin, because he's a dictator who doesn't have to get things passed through Congress, immediately announced new benefits for families with children and increased both pensions and the minimum wage by 10%. So most people didn't even really notice the inflation change. MacBooks and iPhones are still easily available, and people in Moscow say that restaurants have Japanese fish and Spanish cheese and French wine, and yeah, it might cost a bit more, but there's no shortage. 
So it's probably not a surprise then, if you're just listening to Russian news and living a regular Russian life, that you might buy into the idea that your country is really just undertaking a relatively special, small military operation to liberate the Ukrainians from evil NATO who wants to ruin or weaken Russia. In fact, the operation apparently has three quarters of the country's support. So the people are either smart enough to not say they disagree, or the Kremlin's message is working. What's not working is the war. The war has been an absolute tragedy for Ukraine and the Ukrainians. And without the soft focus Kerry Lake filter, it has actually been a complete disaster for Russia as well. Hundreds of thousands of people have died on both sides, including thousands of innocent Ukrainian civilians. Ukraine's economy has shrunk by 30%, and 40% of its electricity generating capacity has been damaged. 13 million Ukrainians have become refugees or are internally displaced within the country. The material damage to their infrastructure, housing, and industry amounts to hundreds of billions of dollars, and whenever the war is over, reconstruction costs are going to easily exceed a trillion dollars. Russia has lost half of its tanks and armored vehicles, its best warship, and at least 200,000 soldiers. But like any good propagandist, the Russian military has only confirmed 6,000 deaths. Perhaps that's because Putin promised a generous compensation to families of enlisted men who were killed in action, about $160,000. So keeping that official death count low really serves his bottom line. By invading Ukraine, Russia has isolated itself more than any other time since the Cold War, and Western nations have banned together for their defeat, while also taking the chance that Putin won't use nuclear weapons if they back him into a corner. The thing is, Putin invaded Ukraine with the idea that the whole thing would be over in a few days. Russian leadership planned for a three-day war, and almost everyone assumed Russia would win immediately. They were bigger, they had more money, and they had a way bigger army. Their plan was to take over Kyiv, reestablish their puppet government, and be done with it. I think this might be one of the places Russia went wrong. They bought their own propaganda. They believed it was a political war, that there weren't really that many Ukrainians who would be willing to put their lives on the line for their country. They truly thought people would be happy to see them, and they would get the country back under Russian control and face very little resistance. And considering the U.S.'s reaction, or lack thereof, to their invasion and annexation of Crimea, their constant presence in the Donbass region, and even America's underwhelming reaction to Russia's blatant interference in our 2016 election, I'm sure they thought we weren't going to do anything either. I think they believed NATO was weak, and America was distracted with its own bullshit, much of which they had successfully stirred up themselves. And they could just take over this country and no one would really care. And if Trump had been in power, that would have been the case. But the first thing Joe Biden did when he came into office was to recognize that the crisis between Russia and Ukraine was real and that it was something we needed to be paying attention to. The Biden administration was right that Russia was going to invade Ukraine. They were right to persuade other people of that fact. And they were smart to know that they couldn't handle the problem on their own, that they needed allies on their side. America didn't just say, here's our red line, don't cross it. Russia had already proved that they could cross our red lines in Syria, and we did nothing. The Biden administration knew they couldn't alone fix it. They needed a coalition to come together, and they needed to do the hard work of getting that coalition together. This administration also changed the way they reacted to Russia. This was no longer about how Russia was a failed democratic project or Putin was someone we could really do business with. This was more about actually taking the data as it was and responding to it in real time. It wasn't the idea of what could happen. It was what was actually happening. So Putin invaded thinking no one would really care. The Ukrainians wouldn't care and the world wouldn't care. And in that, he truly missed the mark. As the war began, a lot of the commentaries still focused on Russia's advantages, the size of their military, their overwhelming air force and firepower, their incredible navy, their badass non-woke soldiers, their expansive cyber capacity. The general consensus was along the train of Russian thought, that they would rapidly overwhelm and conquer their neighbor, that the strength of the Russian army was reported to be so overwhelming that as the first Russian forces crossed the border, we had experts around the world analyzing which pro-Moscow Ukrainian politician would be leading the new regime. But as Phillips Peyton O'Brien from The Atlantic writes, the first lesson we all learned is that war is rarely easy or straightforward, which is why starting one is almost always the wrong decision. 
Instead of unleashing a modern-day war machine on Ukraine, in reality, Russia seemed to be relying on antiquated weaponry and command structures. Instead of taking Kyiv in days, Russian forces experienced major system breakdowns, and since then, their problems have only gotten worse. The Russians miscalculated. They miscalculated the will of the Ukrainians to become an independent country with their own identity. They underestimated their passion to fight to remain a democracy. This wasn't just about land to Ukrainians. This was about their homeland. This invasion was an existential threat to their very existence. It was the difference between them continuing as a people with an independent democracy, free to live as they wanted, or ceasing to exist at all. The Russians also underestimated how over them the Ukrainians were, how tired they were of being undermined and undervalued by this bully next door who thought he owned them, how sick they were of having to fight Russians for their own land. Quite frankly, they were mad as hell and they weren't going to take it anymore. And every granny making a Molotov cocktail or farmer stealing a tank or young couple fighting side by side on the battlefield showed that resolve and strengthened their national identity and bolstered their refusal to go down without a fight. Russia miscalculated the strength of Ukraine's leader. An ex-actor and comedian, Vladimir Zelensky came into power with limited expectations, but he has risen to the occasion the way few others could. This war has made him a hero. His refusal to leave the country, his frontline visits with the troops, his famous line, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. The battle fatigues, the steely gaze, the hoodies that say, I am Ukrainian. His choice to only speak Ukrainian moving forward has caused a large amount of Ukrainians to stop speaking Russian as well. Statues of Russian leaders have been torn down. Street names have been changed. Russian history is being left out of textbooks. Putin's invasion has helped the Ukrainians solidify their own identity. As one of Zelensky's closest advisors said, no one will ever confuse Ukraine and Russia again. No one will say, oh, it's somewhere over there near Russia. Never again. The Russians miscalculated the outrage most of the world would feel watching this injustice and horror unleashed on innocent people. They underestimated that human decency still exists for a good part of the world. Putin is a cynical person. And perhaps he forgot that the rest of the world isn't as cynical as him. He didn't seem to realize that aiming to wipe out an entire group of people would go beyond politics and borders. That Ukraine would win the hearts and minds across the world. That blue and yellow flags would be everywhere from people's t-shirts to their internet profiles. Foreign fighters arrived in the country to join the front line. And aid workers from around the world risked their lives on Ukrainian battlefields. Russia might have the support from the autocrats of the world, many of who owe their positions of power to Russia, like Belarus, or need Russia as an ally, like Iran, or share Russia's worldview, like China or North Korea, but a good part of the world is behind Ukraine, both for humanitarian reasons and because most of us are smart enough to see the writing on the wall. If we say, hey, if you're bigger and more powerful, you can just take what you want, no one's going to stop you, where does that end? It's a horrifyingly slippery slope that most countries have no desire to be on. With that in mind, Russia also miscalculated the strength of the NATO alliance and the years of foreign policy experience that America's new president brought to the table. Thanks to Joe Biden's experienced diplomacy, and quite frankly, thanks to his personal humility, it appears that the relationship between the U.S. and the European Union has never been stronger. And that has absolutely been critical to sanctions placed on Russia during this invasion. Now, sanctions might not have made as much of a difference as we hoped, but NATO member countries and allies have rallied to support Ukraine in many other ways, with several even changing decades-old policies that prohibited the export of weapons to countries in conflict. NATO has delivered weapons, they've delivered billions of dollars in aid, and they have pledged to stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes, hardening its bonds between the countries that might have taken far longer to build in peacetime. In many ways, Putin's need to control and dominate Ukraine drove Ukraine into the arms of his enemy. 
Now, I know it might feel a bit jarring to stop talking about war and start talking about cosmetics, but I'm so grateful for our sponsors to care enough about the world to support this kind of programming that I think it's great to take a moment and really thank them for making it possible to bring this kind of information to you. Today's pod is sponsored by Thrive Cosmetics. Every time I talk about this product, I talk about their liquid lash extension mascara, which I am obsessed with. But today, I'm gonna talk about their Sheer Strength Hydrating Lip Tint. Now, I'm not a lipstick girl. I've never mastered it, and I have big lips by nature, so when I put color on them, I often feel like it's all you can see is my lips. I usually just use a little gloss, but this is why I love the Hydrating Lip Tint. It hydrates your lips with just a little bit of color that goes on evenly and lasts up to six hours. It's comfortable enough to wear all day, and it comes in six different shades, so you can't go wrong. It's lightweight, non-sticky, and makes your lips visibly softer and smoother while making you look just a little bit more pulled together. As you know, I love a product with a cause, and Thrive Cosmetics is spelled C-A-U-S-E for a reason. Part of their mission is that every product purchase supports organizations that help our communities, things like battling domestic abuse, homelessness, and cancer. It's 100% vegan and cruelty-free, so no animals were harmed in the making of it. And it's made with clean, skin-loving ingredients with no parabens, sulfates, or phthalates. But you have to try Thrive Cosmetics to see for yourself. Right now, you can get an exclusive 15% off your first order when you visit thrivecosmetics.com slash politicsgirl. That's Thrive Cosmetics, spelled C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S dot com slash politicsgirl for 15% off your first order. And don't forget to throw in that mascara. I swear to God, it's the best. This war is a travesty, and everyone can see it. Pictures and stories show us the horror of this invasion. I'm sure most of you have stopped looking at these pictures because it feels too difficult to absorb. People living in filth and freezing cold in underground shelters without furniture or running water. Children sleeping on the floor trying to learn and play while everyone else stands around in their outdoor clothes inside. There is a picture of a woman walking by her house. Rubble is everywhere. A handmade ladder comes down from an upper window, and she is holding a cat as she makes her way past the dead bodies of her husband, her brother, and another man who were all killed outside her home. The bodies just lie there. There's no one to take them. She just has to exist in that reality. Photos and videos show people searching for their belongings and loved ones amongst the rubble of what was once their apartment building or their home. People walk down the streets with burning buildings on either side, covered in the dust of past explosions. Hundreds of people attend funeral ceremonies for multiple people killed in airstrikes. Hundreds of displaced citizens line up with empty plastic bottles to refill drinking water from a tank in the center of town. Families weep as they're separated from each other at checkpoints and train stations, some leaving for safety while others stay behind to fight. Destruction surrounds these people. Air sirens fill their ears. The smell of burning and death assaults their noses. Their bathtubs are filled with water, so if the power or water plants are hit by Russian missiles, they won't die of thirst. There are apps on their phone that tell them when Russian missiles and drones are incoming. On one of the apps, Mark Hamill is the voice. And when danger has passed, Luke Skywalker reassures the people the alert is over. And he says, may the force be with you. It's surreal. Their country is destroyed. Their economy has been decimated. Over a hundred thousand of them are dead. Millions of them are homeless. And for what? For one man's imperial dreams and hubris that he could just take what he wanted? That is something we can't allow to stand. That's something that should be completely unacceptable to us, and something that if Putin wins this war, sets an untenable precedent for fellow autocrats and dictators to disrupt the entire world order. Which is why, on the anniversary of Russia's invasion, countries all over the world are reiterating their support for Ukraine. European leaders express solidarity with the young and brave nation, with the 30 member countries of the NATO alliance, vowing solidarity with the government and people of Ukraine, and their heroic defense of their nation, their land, and our shared values. NATO's official position is that Russia bears full responsibility for this war, calling it a blatant violation of international law and the UN Charter. And the countries in the alliance have promised to increase their political and practical support and to maintain that support for as long as necessary until Ukraine prevails. 
The European Union put out a statement that said, Ukraine is part of our European family. And they went on to say, Ukrainians have expressed their wish for a future within the European Union, and we have acknowledged that by granting Ukraine the status of candidate country. The choice of the people of Ukraine is one of peace, democracy, rule of law, and respect for fundamental rights and prosperity. The president of the European Commission went on to address Ukraine directly, saying, you are fighting for freedom, for democracy, and for your place in the European Union. We are with you for as long as it takes. Japan is hosting the G7 this year, and their prime minister plans to use his time as leader of the event to strengthen the unity of like-minded countries against Russian aggression. He was quoted saying, it has come to light that globalization and interdependence alone cannot serve as a guarantor for peace and development across the globe. And that if we let this unilateral change of the status quo by force go unchallenged, it will no doubt happen elsewhere in the world, including Asia. Prime Minister Kishida is clearly making reference to China here, who is no doubt watching the Russian invasion with great interest. Like Russia feels Ukraine belongs to it, China clearly believes the same of independent Taiwan. With that in mind, China has chosen to have a, quote, no limits friendship with Russia. They have refused to criticize the war, refuse to refer to the conflict as an invasion, and are towing the line that Russia was provoked into using military force by NATO's eastward expansion. China and Russia are aligned in their foreign policy to oppose the U.S., and the two countries have drawn closer together during this war, with China buying most of Russia's oil and gas to help Moscow offset Western sanctions that threatened to bankrupt it. So Western sanctions might have worked if China hadn't bailed them out. Now the Chinese have proposed their own peace plan, which basically reads like a bunch of platitudes, but which Vladimir Zelensky cautiously welcomed on the one-year anniversary of this attack. He says, if it means that Putin pulls all his troops out of occupied Ukraine, that he will talk. Currently, the Chinese peace plan has Russia taking no responsibility for their actions. And China also coyly floated the idea that they might be open to actually arming the Russians in this war to which the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, told them would trigger a strong response from Washington, because doing so would completely change the tenor of this war. As David Rothkop, foreign policy and national security analyst and author, recently said on MSNBC, we should find it very interesting how much China has made itself a part of this war keeping Russia afloat and giving them security, because it shows us that the war is really part of a bigger picture, which is, will we have a future dominated by democracies or autocracies? There are a rising amount of autocracies in the world who seek to undo the international system, who want to answer to no one and keep themselves in power. So one country invading another country with the goal of exterminating its population is not just terrible in and of itself. If allowed, it will fundamentally remake the world we live in. If this behavior succeeds, the behavior will only, as Rothkop says, grow exponentially and continue indefinitely. When asked about China's recent visit to Moscow, the Chinese foreign minister called it an opportunity to work with Russia to jointly promote steady progress of bilateral relations in the direction determined by the two leaders. Okay. And then he went on to say, to safeguard each other's legitimate rights and interests and contribute positively to world peace. I mean, aside from the Miss America answer of world peace, it's important to take this wordy statement with a grain of salt, since both countries claim legitimate rights and interests to other nations, and both leaders are autocrats who kill dissidents. So I'm not sure any of us should want to go in the direction that they determine is right. When Republican Senator Mitt Romney was asked why America should care about this war or why it was in our best interest to be helping Ukraine, one of his main points was China. He points out that Russia is China's only real ally when it comes to power. So if someone is concerned about China, then they should see a weaker Russia as a weaker China. Romney says, along with it being the right thing to do by humanity, a weaker Russia means a safer America. A weaker China means a safer America. And Russia's failure to acquire Ukraine might even dissuade China from invading Taiwan, 
a war which America could not avoid being a part of because we have promised to protect Taiwan in the case of an invasion from Beijing. Romney points out that history tells us that violence begets violence. And if we have nations thinking they can just invade their neighbors without response, then it's only going to happen again. And there's no way America gets to stay out of every single one of these wars. And he says, ultimately, Americans are more prosperous, have better jobs, better incomes, and better prospects for the future if we live in a world at peace. A world in conflict makes everyone less safe and less well off. Taiwan themselves put out a moving video on the anniversary of the invasion, saying the Ukrainians have inspired the world with their incredible bravery and determination, and they will continue to stand with Ukraine and support their partners in democracy and freedom. Now, of course, Taiwan has a very specific reason to want Ukraine to succeed, because they want China to learn the right lessons about how the world responds and how America responds, and the passion we really have for democracy and how much we're willing to fight to protect it. Speaking at the same press conference in Kyiv, marking the first anniversary of Moscow's attack, Zelensky said he wants to believe that despite Western leaders' skepticism and their argument that Beijing doesn't have international credibility to be a mediator, China really is interested in a fair peace. But he goes on to be very clear that to believe them, that would mean they would agree not to supply any weapons to Russia. Zelensky has indicated that he's willing to consider the Chinese proposal and that he's planned to meet with President Xi Jinping because ultimately peace is good for global security. Ukraine does, however, have their own 10-point peace plan formula that includes the withdrawal of all Russian troops, reparations for damages, and prosecutions for Russia's war crimes. Prosecutions and accountability are essential to Ukraine, as Russia stands accused of state-orchestrated genocide against the Ukrainian people. The New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy and the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights did an independent legal analysis of the Russian Federation's breaches of the Genocide Convention in Ukraine in May of 2022, and it has only gotten worse since then. The final report states that there is reasonable grounds to conclude Russia is responsible for direct public incitement to commit genocide and to a pattern of atrocities from which an intent to destroy the Ukrainian national group can be drawn. First, high-level Russian officials and state media commentators repeatedly and publicly denied the existence of a distinct Ukrainian identity, implying those who self-identified as Ukrainian threatened the unity of Russia, or they were Nazis, and were therefore deserving of punishment. This is what is historically called accusations in a mirror where a perpetrator accuses a targeted group of planning or having committed atrocities like those they plan to use against the other people, framing themselves as the victim and making violence against this group seem defensive and necessary. The independent report makes it very clear that Vladimir Putin and Russian officials did exactly this, made the utterly false claim that Ukrainians had committed genocide or exterminated the civilian population in Russia for the pretext of invading Ukraine. Denazification was repeatedly claimed to be one of the main goals of the invasion, and Russians have described Ukrainians as subhuman, using words like zombified, bestial, subordinate. They have called them diseased, contaminated, scum, filth. The Russians turned the idea of Ukraine into an existential threat, invoking Nazism, Hitler youth, and the Third Reich. This rhetoric was used to portray a substantial segment of the Ukrainian population as mortal enemies, rendering them as necessary targets for destruction. At home, the Russian state orchestrated a campaign of propaganda that would convince Russians and the wider public that there was justification to condone these mass atrocities. In April of 2022, the deputy chair of the Russian Security Council wrote, having transformed itself into the Third Reich, Ukraine will suffer the same fate exactly what it deserves. President Putin sent a telegram to the Russian-backed separatists in the Donbass region, claiming they were fighting for the liberation of their native land from the Nazi filth, vowing that victory will be ours like in 1945. The Russian Orthodox Church publicly reinforced this historical parallel and praised the Russian fight against the Nazis. The Russian Federation was able to directly incite the public, funneling and amplifying their propaganda through a controlled media landscape and using extreme censorship around the war. 
The report says that the purveyors of this incitement propaganda are all highly influential political, religious, and state-run media figures, including President Putin himself. The report goes on to say that Russian soldiers internalized their state's propaganda campaign by echoing its content while committing atrocities. Reported statements from soldiers include threats to rape every Nazi whore, reference to hunting the Nazis, liberating you from the Nazis, and cleansing them from the dirt after public executions. Russia has a lot to answer for with this invasion. But what distinguishes genocide from other international crimes is the intent to destroy in whole or in part a protected group. And this intent can be seen through evidence of a general plan, official statements, official documents, and policy, and can be inferred from a systemic pattern of atrocities that target that protected group. To this point, part five of the report shows a genocidal pattern of destruction targeting Ukrainians with, among other things, mass killings. Russian forces rounded up Ukrainian citizens for mass executions across occupied territories. These killings were marked by a pattern of tied hands, torture, and shots at close range in the back of the head. The number of mass graves throughout Russian-occupied Ukraine with this pattern only continues to expand as the Russians are pushed out of territories, and we can see what they have done. The report shows that Russians deliberately attacked shelters, evacuation routes, and humanitarian corridors, killing and trapping civilians in conflict areas. The Russians have held Ukrainian citizens and deprived them of basic necessities, leading to many deaths of suffocation or starvation. And Russians have followed a similar pattern in all Ukrainian cities they've attacked, first striking water, power, and communication, then further targeting medical facilities, green warehouses, and distribution centers, and further suggesting that the military's strategy is to deliberately inflict fatal conditions on Ukrainians. Russians have repeatedly blocked or seized humanitarian aid and workers seeking to evacuate citizens. They have used rape and sexual violence as a weapon of war in Russian-occupied areas of Ukraine, suggesting a widespread and systemic pattern that includes gang rape, rape in homes and shelters, rape of parents in front of their children, and rape of children in front of their parents. The last hideous thing I will mention is that the Russians have been reported to have forcibly transferred over one million people from Ukraine to Russia since the invasion began, including over 180,000 children. Refugees and officials have reported being transferred by force or by threat of force. According to Ukrainian officials, Russian legislation has been reformed to expedite the adoption of children. Ukrainian children are forcibly sent to Russian territories, forced to take Russian classes, and are adopted by Russian people. To be clear, the forcible transfer of Ukrainian children to Russia is officially a genocidal act under Article 2E of the Genocide Convention. So despite President Zelensky being open to peace talks, there seemed to be very little prospect of him being open to direct negotiations with Russia. What Russia has done to Ukraine will not be forgiven. Zelensky has very clearly stated that he will not compromise with this sick and bloody leadership, that Russia turned from a neighbor and friend to a murderer who has killed and tortured our people and abducted our children. Which one of us believes he should sit down and negotiate with him after that? In fact, all nation states have a legal obligation to prevent genocide. Once a nation becomes aware of a serious risk of genocide within their borders or without, which this report from last spring and further evidence throughout the past year have clearly established, then they are no longer allowed to deny knowledge and the Genocide Convention imposes a minimum legal obligation on them to take reasonable action to contribute to preventing and protecting those under attack. So for anyone that says Ukrainians should just give up or negotiate with the Russians or that NATO and the EU should stop giving aid and money because it's not their fight, it is our fight. We now know what Russians are doing, and it's on all of us who know to take reasonable action to prevent it. Now, because we're dealing with a major nuclear power whose actions we can't be sure of, we have to be careful of how we handle the situation. But doing nothing isn't a possibility. The question is, how much can we help without getting into it with Russia ourselves? 
It is an incredibly fine line to walk, and I must say, I'm very glad it's the Biden administration that's the one trying to figure it out. This war has proved how much leadership matters. Bad leadership, like Putin's, can be so destructive. Good leadership, like Zelensky's, can be so inspirational. And wise leadership, like Biden's, can be transformative. We have also seen the impact of good combat leadership. On the one side, the Western-trained and oriented Ukrainians have prepared their junior leaders and senior soldiers and non-commissioned officers to take the initiative and lead their soldiers by example. The Ukrainian military leadership clearly thinks things through in advance. They are deeply prepared and have deployed their forces with precision to defeat Russians in the north, south, and east. Plus, they just have this amazingly positive attitude. Have you seen them dance? The Russians, on the other hand, have demonstrated terrible battlefield leadership on every level. Russian high command initially decided to fight multiple separate ground wars in the south, east, and north, as well as launching an air war without a unified command structure. At lower levels, they've been more than professionally incompetent. They have committed their forces piecemeal instead of as a unit, failed to provide logistical support, or properly equip many of their mobilized soldiers. No wonder so many of their soldiers are deserting and surrendering to the Ukrainians. Putin has changed commanders so many times, it would be laughable if there was a single thing funny about this. And no matter how bad things seem to be getting, they continue to do the same things over and over, expecting a different result. Military experts point out that they've also failed to combine their air and land forces, so they often end up working against each other. With this in mind, Zelensky remains confident that his army will drive the Russians from all of his territory, including Crimea. He, like 95% of Ukrainians, is confident that they will win, and they will win this year. But he understands that a prolonged war does not favor Ukraine. At the end of the day, a long war favors Russia because of its size, its resilient economy, and the sheer amount of people Putin could put in front of Ukrainian weapons. As someone said, Ukraine would run out of bullets before Russia ran out of Russians to put in front of those bullets. So it's becoming all the more clear that Ukraine's future is dependent on a shorter, more decisive campaign funded by the West. Zelensky said he had a very frank discussion with Joe Biden, the EU, and the UK about including long-range artillery and fighting jets in the next packages of aid. So far, the US has refused to provide long-range artillery because they're concerned it might hit targets inside of Russia, drawing US into a war with Putin. But Zelensky was adamant that he required them to protect his citizens and he would use the systems only to target enemies inside occupied areas. Time is clearly of the essence, and Zelensky wants no delays. Zelensky told China that if Russia wants them to negotiate on anything, the Russians need to stop shelling us, destroying our infrastructure, launching airstrikes, killing animals, and burning our forests. He is clear that there is no peace without a full withdrawal of Russian troops from all Ukrainian territories. And as we know, he wants reparations for damages and prosecutions of Russian leadership. Which, after hearing what they've done, I would hope the rest of the Western world would want as well. There have been over 70,000 documented war crimes by Russian occupiers in the past year, including rape, mass murder, and kidnapping. What are the MAGA representatives, or the right-wing pundits, or the people who marched in the war machine rally in Washington, D.C., thinking to suggest Biden negotiate with Russia to end this war or cut off aid to the Ukrainians? Anyone who suggests the end of the war without a Russian defeat are pro-Russian apologists. That peace rally in D.C. had a lot of flags, including American flags and three separate Russian flags, but it didn't have a single Ukrainian flag. Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014, in 2015, in 2022, but we're supposed to believe that the war is happening because of them? Come on. If you're making excuses for this war or talking about finding middle ground with the Russians, you can't call yourself anti-war because you stand with the invaders. Where's the middle ground with people who steal your children and rape your citizens and throw the brutalized bodies of innocents into mass graves? Zelensky reminds us all that this war is not a dispute between unhappy neighbors, but one where Ukrainians are fighting for their very existence. All they want is to be left alone, to live in a civilized society with European values and freedom. When asked if he believed Moscow would invade another state if it won Ukraine, Zelensky said yes. Putin has failed on the battlefield. 
even if he wins, he will need to continue to demonstrate success. That battlefield loss might be why Putin is threatening to use nuclear weapons, or has recently backed out of New START, the last remaining U.S.-Russian arms control treaty. Pulling out of this treaty will have an immediate impact on what the U.S. can see in regards to Russian nuclear activities. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken called this move deeply unfortunate and irresponsible and said, we'll be watching to see what Russia actually does, and we will make sure that in any event, we are postured appropriately for the security of our country and that of our allies. This war has made us think about how we use force in the world, about the importance of diplomacy, about what belongs to what country and what kind of behavior is appropriate. And I think Putin's behavior and his lack of interest in the good of anything beyond his own interests is deeply inappropriate, making it essential to the future of our world that he loses, and he loses big. Joe Biden seems to agree. He has called Putin a murderous dictator and war criminal who should no longer be in power. And it's important that we note that this kind of statement is a major departure from any American president before him. He is not hedging or trying to say the right thing politically. He is standing up for what's right. And although this kind of clear and straightforward language is a major step for an American president, it should be noted that his comments hardly registered in Russia. The Putin regime has been painting America as the enemy for years. They're always telling their people we're against them and we think they're war criminals. So now that we're actually treating their leadership like enemies and war criminals and saying things like Putin has to go, they're barely covering it. You see, propaganda only works if you're in charge of it. If you're saying the American president says these things, that's one thing. If the American president is actually saying these things, that makes them look weak because the message is out of their control. Timothy Snyder believes Putin will lose this conventional war, and by losing the war, it will send political ripples through his country, which might cause him to lose power. But Snyder reminds us no matter how this shakes out, Americans shouldn't get too emotionally invested in Russian leadership. We liked Yeltsin, we liked Gorbachev, but it's really none of our business. Our job is to busy ourselves preparing policy for whoever comes next, because there will be someone next. Putin created a situation that could bring him down. It didn't need to happen. He mobilized a half a million Russian soldiers to go and fight an utterly pointless war in which many of them are going to die, and he could lose his power and create domestic consequences for himself because of it. But that is on Putin. And Snyder reminds us how important it is for the United States to recognize that these things have their own logic. Dictators fall from power. It always happens. And we should just be ready for it. Snyder believes that we should do our best to deter nuclear weapon use and to end the war in Ukraine as quickly as possible, which, he's very clear, means helping the Ukrainians win it as quickly as possible, because that is the only way it can end. As Snyder says, we shouldn't be talking about who we want to rule Russia or about Russia falling apart. If the Russians start a war and they lose a war, let them figure out what happens next. It is our job to make sure they don't win. And the rest is up to the Russians themselves. So that's it. That's why you should care. That's why you should feel relieved that we had the Biden administration on deck for this crisis and should want to continue with their leadership moving forward. This is why winning this war matters and why supporting Ukraine matters. However this shakes out, this war will ultimately leave Russia diminished militarily, economically, and geopolitically. But that is a choice they made for themselves. Freedom is a choice Ukraine made for itself. And we need to support freedom and democracy wherever and whenever we can. Winning this war is essential for Ukraine, but it's also essential for the world order. We must tell the wannabe invaders of the world that we are watching, that we will fight back, and they can't just take what doesn't belong to them. I want to thank you for joining me today and for caring enough about this issue to stick with it. This war really does matter, and good really can triumph if enough of us stand behind it. Slava Ukraini. Until next week, PGF. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.